Hello, I'm Alessandra Cummins. And I'm Alison Thompson. In 1999, a year after the dedication of Barbados's 10 national heroes, a committee of persons from a wide arena of endeavors was established by government under the chairmanship of the then Clerk of Parliament, George Branker. Its mandate was to make recommendations for the development of National Heroes Square and National Heroes Gallery, highlighting the lives of our national heroes. It also developed plans for the documentation and preservation of the history of Parliament. After two years of work and public meetings, giving consideration to many different proposals, the committee submitted its final report and recommendations to Parliament for the conversion of the West Wing of the public buildings into a gallery and documentation centre in the space formerly occupied by the General Post Office. Several years passed before work began again on the refurbishment of the West Wing. In 2005, a new committee was formed to oversee this work, at which time it was decided to develop two galleries, one dedicated to the history of Parliament, the other to our national heroes. This documentary dedicates its focus to the latter. The space having been identified, designs were developed which called for objects and works of art that would portray the ten heroes. The easy solution would have been to commission ten statues, realistic representations of the heroes. The committee, however, after consulting with art advisors, decided to take a conceptual approach and a number of artists who had at one time or another expressed interest in the challenge of creating large-scale public works were invited to respond to an artist's brief. Based on these artist submissions of sketches, models, and written proposals, 10 were selected, each being given the choice of selecting one hero on which to focus their attention. These 10 artists included wood and stone sculptors, ceramists, and metal workers. Their task was to study the life and work of their selected or assigned hero and create a piece which was symbolic of that person's achievements and contribution to the national and social development of Barbados. In addition to these 10, two painters were also selected to create murals which would chronicle the pre- and post-emancipation periods in this island's history. This documentary serves to chronicle the work of these artists and their concepts of heroism. The process of capturing each artist's concept of heroism involved Alison meeting with each artist here at Heroes Gallery or at their studios where the pieces were created. In some cases, she met with artists at both locations. It was a very interesting exercise to discover the thought processes which inspired the concepts behind each piece and to hear not only the stories of the creation of the artwork, but of the lives of the artists themselves. In sharing this with you, we start with the Bill Grace sculpture dedicated to the right excellent Sir Grantley Adams. Sir Grantley, whose major contribution to social change took place between the 1930s and 1960s, had a vision that was fixed on nothing but the task of bringing the oppressed masses out of social and economic bondage. Sir Grantley was the first Premier of Barbados and only Prime Minister of the West Indies Federation. Sculptor Bill Grace studied Sir Grantley's vision and achievements and combined with his passion for Barbadian soft stone set about to reflect Adam's life in an obelisk. To better understand the creative process, Alison first asked Bill to talk about his entry into the arts. I was interested in architecture and I went to Canada, but I went into pre-architecture. And the Dean of Engineering recommended I broaden my base, so I'm still doing that. But I love architecture and I wrote a thesis on the sociology of architecture, how architecture affects us after we we construct it and then it constructs us in a way. And I see this as my, my work getting big. So I went into painting, I went into pottery, I went into sculpture also, very much into sculpture but more modest. Bill, I'm interested that this is a conceptual piece of sculpture and I'm wondering what it was about the man himself that inspired you and what qualities were there that you really tried to bring out in the work? He had a vision and uh, this vision encompass many things, but the thing that he achieved uh, symbolically was being the only Prime Minister of the Federation of the West Indies. And some kind of uh, federation is an important, uh, I think it's important for us. I think we've had a lot of vertical relationships with the mother countries, and then the countries that are here, right next to each other, 
have not had the lateral relationships that are now symbolically being formed by BWIA and LIAT and so on. So this, his vision was a vision that we are just beginning to, to, uh, to bring into being. So one of the aspects of this sculpture was uh, that it might be misaligned, not yet fully stacked perfectly. Um, so I just left a hint of that, but the, I, left, I had to choose between his vision or the reality. And so I went more closely to the vision. Our rock here is very beautiful, uh, and it has many names. One of them, the local one, is soft stone. And so anyone who has worked with uh, our local limestone, it's, it's very friable and it's very difficult to work with. So I have really enjoyed taking found pieces and taking the, their fractures and their natural marks and the marks of process and working with them. But I have begun to also cast. I use the coral, put it in a dust form and put it with white cement and I make a new rock and then I work with that. And in a way it's kind of symbolic of, of all of us coming here of being ground down and being reformed in the Caribbean person emerging from the places where we've come from or our ancestors have come from. So this is something that has not escaped my attention and it's something that uh, I like about the process. And then it's working also on the surface then I work, I work it. I mean one of the things that I sometimes forget but I acknowledge is my, my, grand, my mother's father, my grandfather was a wood carver and I'm using wood carving tools uh, actually <laughs> not stone tools uh, as I work the surface and, uh, and the marks on the surface also have a certain rhythm and the rhythm in my mind it has something to do with, with how Sir Grantley's vision encompassed where we are, we are going because when you're a visionary and he was called Moses and he was appreciated and people that was his popular name because he led the people so many times in different uh, struggles so this one was was a vision of something that hadn't happened a lot of the other things he brought into being so in this case uh, CARICOM which is kind of the successor of the West Indies Federation so I've highlighted their nations with the jewel-like um, turquoise glass and the other nations are simply in clay. The ones that are in the Caribbean have marks of coral on, on the clay and the ones that are in the, in the uh, bigger land mass, South America and Central America, they have a more generic kind of a mark because they're, they're not so coral oriented. And then the sea, the flow of the rhythm of the sea is, uh, is from the carving. So Bill, you could just describe the piece for us. Well, it is an obelisk. It's seven feet. Uh, because the map is turned on its side, and Barbados is on the high right side, turns out Barbados is on top. So I'm sure Barbadians will like that. That was uh, just an artifact of having it uh, vertically aligned. Um, and the scale, the scale was designed really uh, taking artistic license in terms of the relative sizes. And the rhythm of these, of these marks, I mean each, each one of these little indentations is one hit. So it's really, I mean, as I'm doing it, I mean this one really did take a lot of, of work. But, you know, I, I, I don't think I can count how many times that hammer hit that chisel. And that, that amuses me. Now, I really like, for instance, this line passing through here. And it passes through from one to the other one. And it is a mosaic. And one of my very close friends is, is well into her 80s and is a major mo mosaic artist. And uh, we talk and think about mosaic. So it is, it is basically, as if I would describe it, it's a mosaic uh, obelisk. And it's using materials that I have evolved it was 
from many years of, of working and thinking from the pieces that uh, I started, you remember, with these found coral pieces and assembling them, and until uh, working, you know, owning the surface more. And so it's a kind of a logical extension of, of a long process. I worked with the logic of how I'm developing, and I'm working with the lightness, I'm working with the surface, with, with this carving, with my grandfather's gouge, and I'm working with the glass that I also cast and fire. It reminds me of a commission I did a few years ago for the 375th of Bridgetown. And I was supposed to do contemporary Bridgetown. Well, thank goodness someone else did historic Bridgetown. So I really, for me, the contemporary is built on what has gone before. And I went way before. It's like geological reference. Because what I'm working with is the geology of the island. So. It, I really do think geologically, and like I'm revealing things. It's a problem that I'm casting, but the problem actually brings good with it in terms of how we are ground down by our experience by being moved here and rebuilt as new people, as Caribbean people. Of the many social changes brought about by the right excellent Arrow Barrow in Barbados, the most noteworthy was the independence of the island from Britain in 1966. The challenge of portraying the father of independence was given to Dr. Lance Bannister, a medical doctor who has a talent for metalwork. Dr. Bannister uses mainly parts from old cars to create his unique works of art with much of his inspiration for working in this medium coming from early statues based on Greek mythology. Well, I said from the earliest days, I saw beautiful sculptures that had been done 2,000 years ago um, in Greece by Phygias in, in, in marble. Then we saw sculptures in bronze. Uh, well, sometime after that, I had the privilege of studying medicine, which gave me a bit of a knowledge of anatomy. And then when I came back from the university, I came across uh, a chap who had been collecting old car parts and he saw the resemblance between these parts and the human anatomy and I said well if you can do sculptures in bronze and, and marble and so on maybe you can do them in iron in other words once Picasso had done whatever he had to do then you're permitted to do anything so then we found we thought that cars would give you a nice medium and then it would also help to clean up the environment so it would be eco-friendly. So I collected these parts and with the aid of welding, uh, Prometheus, Hephaestus magic, we put them together. Now, medicine also gave me comparative anatomy so I could see the resemblance between the human body and the animal's bodies. So having done that, one of my earlier pieces was Mannix, Man Ex Machina, a piece that uh, was of a man, uh, which we took to Kai Festa Five in Trinidad, somewhere around 1993 or thereabouts. Yeah, and I think it was quite a, a success. And every part in it, for instance, the the heart of the man was taken as it was a carburetor from the car. So the carburetor which pumped. Uh, gas before, no pump blood. And what about the sculpture you did of Errol Barrow? What was, what was a particular challenge with that work? I had been collecting a lot of material here, old car parts. And then after a time, I was forced to get rid of them. But I kept what looked like it would make itself into a man. And that, here the pieces were Brobdingnagian, really huge. And we use the front members of old cars, parts that don't exist nowadays. 
and you've made them into legs, head, all the different parts. And it turned out to be a, a man eight foot four. Can you tell me what it was about the man, his qualities and his achievements that you tried to focus on in your work? Well, he was probably one of the greatest heroes of Barbados, of the West Indies. And uh, apart from his early scholarship and serving in the RAF, he came back and helped to liberate the country of Barbados. And uh, he later introduced universal education and he sort of established a democracy in the, in the country. Describe your sculpture for me and explain how you brought out those pieces in the work, brought out those qualities in the work. Well, the sculpture is made of iron, old car parts that have been collected from several different places. And they show his strength uh, and his irresistibility. And strangely, I was able to show how the different parts of the car could be reconstructed to, to show one, his strength of character, his vision as seen by his eyes, his uh, stature, and how he overwhelmed, he was superior, stood up like a colossus over the, the whole political arena. These upper parts are, assist the car in moving from place to place. And I've made them into a crown. The eyes are also parts of a shock absorber. And they can look right through the deeds of men. The mouth like a politician keeps talking. Uh, the head, and so, no, the head is of gold, like, like Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Head of gold, chest of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And these hubcaps represent medallions of his success. Uh, one shows that he was an island scholar, that he studied in London, London School of Economics. Then he came and he gave Barbados independence. He also was a pilot in the Air Force. And then eventually he gave free education to the people of Barbados, no matter whether they could afford it or not. The arms stretch out and embrace friends or ward off enemies. The, the lyrical strains, uh, the lyrical strains actually break tridents and also offer victory and peace. It is an icon that represents the qualities of the man, his iron determination, his stature, his strength, his love, his achievements, and the fact that he stands as a mighty colossus over ordinary and lesser mortals. I know that sometimes you're also a writer, uh, and that you were inspired when making this sculpture to write a poem about it. It is called the Errol Walton Barra Icon and the icon speaks. I come from garbage dump and motor mausoleum. Litter strewn gully vaults and old car museum. Promethean fire and Hephaestus alchemy transformed my rusty bones and sinews to burnished gold. Breathe new life that I might epitaph a hero who enriched the Caribbean with his work, his life, and finally, his ashes. I came, I saw, I conquered, and do bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and petty men walk under my huge legs and peep about to find themselves dishonorable 
Graves. From a chronological point of view, Bassa is Barbados' first national hero. Not much is known about his life. We do not know his real name. We do not know when he was born, only that he came from Africa where he was a free man. He was captured and enslaved, being brought to Barbados and working on Bailey's plantation in St. Philip, where in 1816 he led the island's longest slave revolt. Killed in battle, the right excellent Bussa lives on in the minds of Barbadians as a legendary freedom fighter. John Burgess, another metal sculptor, created this piece in honor of a pre-emancipation hero who gave his life to the cause of freedom. I had this idea for a long time, but not in the sense that... Because to me, Basse isn't really a, a man. And, and it's more like a, a movement and a, and a way of thinking rather than a, rather than a person. I was, I was trying to, I guess, express the, the feeling of the times, where, where the violence and the stuff that happened, where anybody that coming in would be kind of thrown back into to them, to that time. And, and I guess we can learn all the emotions in people, like mostly black people and white people. Because the Sea Party sculpture got a, also a white, a white female too, and it's actually a white English woman, which was, um, I got her to pose for that thing. Um, it, was pretty, it was pretty bad for people like too. Well, the bass, the bass is a coral, coral stone coral rendered bass with, I guess, kind of representing geological um, structure of Barbados and the solid foundation that I'll be on. The, the plow disc is, is, is a piece that I found maybe like five years ago, more than five years ago, maybe, maybe ten years ago, I bought one of these little sugar factories. And there's, some, there's a little hidden detail at the back, which is a partial map of Barbados which most people will notice, but I put it in just for this. And most of the things that I do, I put in a little hidden details that I will recognize. But I wanted to incorporate that into, into um, something at some point. But I didn't know what I was saying, but this, this, this worked out pretty good for me. The cans coming up, the cans made of copper, uh, burnt, burnt copper. It took me a long time to figure out how to do it, but um, it worked out pretty good. It kind of represents that whole, like if, if uh, a fire swept through, just swept through the whole entire place and, and burnt everything, including the, the tops, the, even, even the base, because on the base is, is a kind of burnt, because like, you got to get this special finish on the base too, because it's not rust, it's a, it's a special paint finish. Um, kind of like a change, you know, maybe you get the fire coming through and then it's like a, the tops, they burnt too, but they starting to get back green. So we started to get some new, new birth up there, new growth. The, the cut off feet and the blood and the, the bills and everything else. I just want to get some violets in there so people would see and feel really happen. But the, the, the bills, there's the weapons of choice at the time. Most people won't, won't recognize the curved ones, but people used to use them all the time. They're most, they're most familiar with the machete and the cutlass. These bills, the, um, the choice at the time. Pe people use them. And the weapons of choice for the, for the slaves, the only weapons that, that they had really, except for the fire, which burn everything. Everything, everything turned out exactly how I wanted and, and how, I, how I envisioned it, how I saw it from the beginning. 
the even the past way toy would come out to you the feet but it's, I had a great mark mark Waterman to do the feet paint the feet and he really really did a good job on it the legs made of the inside is concrete the outside is a you'll say this fiberglass and these ones actually cast the, the, the male legs, the big, the big thick ones, I got a greater post of them, um, Owen. He's actually Mr. Barbados. I think the public would, would appreciate it. Um, I have some pretty good reviews already on it from other artists. Um, Akim, Akim who said he loved it. And he, he's a gay respect pretty much. To tell you the truth, I would, I would really like it if if they don't like it as much as you know, you know where they come in. Oh, it's nice, it's nice, it's nice. I don't. I really would prefer if they don't like it because they talk. They'll talk a lot more. I want people to look at it, talk about it, and realize that stuff like this happen, and they need to look back at it and make sure it don't happen again. And tell the truth, it will happen too. We tend to forget things that happen. The right excellent Sarah Ann Gill is Barbados' only female national hero whose life spanned the latter part of the pre and early years of the post emancipation period. She was a Methodist, a member of a denomination which opposed slavery. In the tense period just prior to the abolition of slavery, she was persecuted and prosecuted for holding services in her home after the Methodist chapel had been burned to the ground by pro-slavery advocates. It is perhaps therefore appropriate that a female artist be commissioned to portray this Barbadian freedom fighter. Goldie Spieler, a watercolorist and ceramist, talks with passion about Sarah Ann Gill and the piece in her honor that she created. She was strong, she was determined, she was full of faith, she was God's woman. And I wanted to help depict her because I wanted to be sort of a, a smaller version of God's woman. Uh, but Sarah Ann Gill was just so important in her time, uh, teaching people that she was told she wasn't supposed to teach and she wanted them to be literate and she wanted them to know about the Lord. and. And I wanted to, to just do something that had to do with that. Uh, so Sarah Ann Gill was just a, has always been uh, very special to me as one of the heroes. I didn't know if any other women, women artists were going to be invited to, to do works. I wanted to be the one to do the woman, uh, which was really quite unusual since I'm not, I don't consider myself a very liberated woman, but I guess I am. And very quickly I knew that I had to use, since Sarah Ann was a part of the Methodist Church, I had to use a cross as part of the, the design, and that gave me four other spaces in, in the uh, sections of the cross and so then my major problem was you know how to divide the spaces which will be large which will be small etc and what to put in them uh, her name had to be one had to be the most prominent it's not the largest but it was uh, to me it's the most prominent and who she is is, you know, so that's really the focal point as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then I was led into uh, this definition of hero because Sarah Ann Gill was a woman uh, and the word hero is a masculine word. Uh, heroine, heroine, I didn't like it, didn't sit well with me. Uh, it just doesn't have any 
and there's no panache, there's no, there's no, nothing nice about the word heroine. So how was I going to turn Sarah Ann Gill, a woman, into a hero? And then it was easy. I just put an S in front of the word hero, and so she became a shero, and I munched over that one for a couple of days, and the more I did, the more I smiled, and the more I knew I had to do it. So that gave me three sections, her name, the definition of who she was, and the definition of what the definition meant, <laughs> and, and then uh, something to go in the, 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 the fourth uh, rectangle. And I must confess that I did four different versions of what is there now and, and uh, fired them, looked at them, chose out the one that I thought was the best and the most appropriate. The sections of the cross divided, divided into five spaces so that I could do some freehand carving of pseudo-African, that they are African-ish designs, uh, or cer certainly African motivated designs that I have been looking at and focusing on for all of the 40 years that I've been in Barbados. So doing the work on the cross was for me the most pleasurable. It was the most time consuming because first I had to roll the pieces of, of clay and cut them into the appropriate sizes and then they each one was covered completely with the black or dark gray. And then I sat down with, with a stylus and carved them out. Uh, I knew that I wanted to do something on flat pieces of clay that combined the potter's technology as well as the painter's technology, okay. But then I needed to find a vehicle. That's what we, you know, in art, the wor art world, we need to find a vehicle to display your work on. And I was talking to Don Small about um, what I, you know, how was I going to display these flat pieces that I wanted to do. And he said very quietly, if you drive past where they build boats over on the Spring Garden Highway, you're going to see slices of tree lying on the ground. I got in my car and I drove straight to the shallow draft and I went down with our man the next day and picked up, it picked up. It took six men to lift this slice of tree into the back of our uh, Land Rover and get it up to Shop Hill uh, so that I could then look at it and begin to feel it uh, so that I could do the designing of the sizes and shapes of the rectangles to fit with the tree. And uh, a curator came from Puerto Rico who was giving those of us making things for this gallery advice on how to prepare our materials. And I talked to him about this piece of tree and he came to see it. He was looking at it and he said, judging from the rings in the, in the tree, the, the lines, that he estimated the tree to be about 250 years old, which would put the tree alive when Sarah Ann Gill existed in Barbados. So the whole thing belonged to Sarah Ann and it was just right for it to, to come together in that sort of way. For me, it was an opportunity to, to join my painterly qualities with, with the potter's knowledge. Uh, and to know, I mean, the one thing that, that attracted me to ceramics in the first place, or pottery in the first place, was that I'd had a flood a couple of years before. Of, you know, it wasn't a hurricane, but it was a near hurricane. It was a flooding rain. And where my paintings had been put away uh, had about eight inches of water in the, on the floor. And uh, so I lost a lot of work. And then I discover working with clay and finishing the work with clay. And the only thing that can destroy that is a hammer. And you can get it as wet as you like and it doesn't matter. So, so th th I, these, these were the things that, this was the quality, the, the durability that attracted me to pottery. And then, so doing the piece for Sarah Ann Gill gave me a chance to, to put all of that together, to, 
you know, the designer thing, the, the one section, the, the top left hand corner, was done in a way that I had never worked before. That may not be obvious to anybody looking at it, but uh, I had to use my limited colors that were available here at Earthworks and try to create a painterly kind of piece that would fit with the rest of, of the, the sections that were all quite geometrical, for want of a better word. Um, so I, I just did, you know, so I, I painted it like a watercolor, but I had to look at it in tones of gray because all of our colors look grayish when they're being uh, applied in the, in the green stage. And well, green is a color, but no meaning, green meaning not mature yet. Uh, so in, in that beginning part, I was just looking at shades of gray and having to see everything conceptually in the back of my head to know that it was going to be okay when it came through the firings. It was just, it was lovely to do. It was lovely to do and, and I hope, I knew that it was going to be very simple compared to some of the other uh, offerings that were going to come, although I didn't know what they were. But I think that Sarah Ann Gill with her strength and with her niceness was still a simple person and it was just, I think it's just right for that. It's, just, it's a simple statement of, okay, world, this is who I am. Historian Sir Alexander Hoyos wrote that Adam's purpose after 1934 was to revive the political movement among the masses which Dr. Charles Duncan O'Neill had started. It is O'Neill who is credited with being the first politician in Barbados to campaign for improved conditions for women in the workplace and the fact that women held leadership positions in the Democratic League and the Working Men's Association, organizations which he founded. A medical doctor who studied in England where he lived, worked and entered British politics, winning a seat on a local council, Dr. O'Neill had a desire to return to Barbados and light a match under the authorities to bring about social change. It is the thought of his burning desire which ignited the creativity of Kenneth Blackman in creating his monumental wood carving of the eternal flame as an epitaph to the right excellent Charles Duncan O'Neill. Kenneth first explains how he started working with wood as a medium of his artistic expression. Started with me with a ratchet knife after leaving school, like a ratchet knife around the blocks and thing, and like just picking at small pieces of wood with, with the knife itself. And it got interesting. The more you know, it like used to be like re like relax me and thing. But I tell myself like being a being a painter, um, like doing like pickle and thing around the hotels and through the guest houses and selling in them places. So it became more and more interested, and I like it, use it for a past thing, right? And it got to me that like I, I get to love it more, the more, and that like everything I, I think about doing, it would just I try it. it. It was just like happening for me, right? So I used to like um, when I got one or two um, like shows, like art shows. I would visit the art shows. They were this this guy called Woodpecker, um, Woodpecker, and that I think he's the guy who really inspired, his work really is where it inspired me to get into it, to, into, rather than just with the, um, the ratchet knife, uh, chisel, and try a little further, then that's it, just dive in. 
What was it about the man that you focused on, that you tried to bring out in really this very conceptual sculpture? February, February last year, I, was, I got a letter from um, the organizers um, for the um, Hero Square, this West Wing project, and I was told I was one of the artists that were chosen to produce one of the icons. Um, this was February, during June, I got a visit from, from Denise and um, I think Denise and Dennis or something like that, right? And they told me, they came with me, they say, uh, there's one icon left. It's, it's going to be um, Duncan O'Neill, right? But they don't want him realistic or for that light, right? They want him an abstract form with something that could symbolize or you know, deal with the energy that the man himself had, right? And I, the same evening at my studio, right, the same evening, they asked me if I had to produce him, what would I use to produce him as? And I was there and I was just feeling like, kind of like I'm feeling now, really heated, like a different energy was there besides the three of us, right? So I just said, flames. And they said, how would I got to find a way to produce the flames that it still got that feel of a man or, or that human figure to it. Once I could get the flames coming with that, that energy, right? Or the flow. That, so I went for flames. Can you tell me a little bit specifically about the sculpture, what material you used, where you might have found the wood? They had a meeting. We met here in the Parliament building, and the same day I met um, one of my fellow students, um, Don Small, and he told me there was some good wood um, by St. Gabriel's School, right? So immediately after the meeting, I tell myself that it don't make sense going home, go and check, right? Because I really, for this subject, um, not only the wood size, but color had to matter, right? And so I set off. Went to St. Gabriel's School, the, 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 the wood that was there were already taken, and I met um, Junior Hunt off, let me see, that's just off below the school itself, and he took me to this piece of wood, which was like, it was just waiting in the vein because it, it couldn't, I couldn't get a better piece for the job with the different colors and patterns, and mind you, this piece of wood had to be, this tree had to be like, 300 years or something, and it had already been fallen and like just waiting, right, for the subject itself. The last thing we had to do was to get a high hop and bring it to the thing, but it was, it was this heavy a log that the same place it dropped, it had to start carving because to move it around, it was impossible to move it around. So, like I show you early, close up by the edge of the road, I had to set a tank there, put a tank over it, right, using uh, with the help of a uh, Bernard Clark, right? Um, all the time, or most of the time, especially in the early stages of the sculpture, because of the weight, you needed somebody else to help turn it or push it around. And for a time, it was just laying, and you just had to be working it on the ground because you still couldn't get it up right for that balance, right? So, for a time, that's how it, that's how it was at the top. Then, after cleaning it down and shaping it to the, the shape that I wanted to get that human figure like coming into the flames, right? Uh, we had, let me see, I think it was eight guys rope it up and bring it down to the studio itself there on the floor again. And from there then, we started to go on the inside to help lighten it out too, to take out some more from the inside that would be more easier to maneuver, right, to get it in. So we took out the inside and made it a hollow flame rather than a solid piece itself because it would have been really, really too heavy too. So what was it about this piece of wood that attracted you to it? The difference in colors and, and the, uh, although it was one piece of wood, the different stage that it had aged, although it was one piece of wood, we had the bottom that had already gone and uh, I mean has been aging long before the top. Somehow like after it fall, you know the bark is the feeding area so it was still being fed higher up while the bottom was already in the process, the aging process. That's why you get the darker, and the inside actually was drying out already, although the, the, long, the longer end or the, the smaller branches were still feeding for a little while. 
that's where you get the difference in color and shades as you go up. Can you tell me a little bit about the process of actually making it, whether you had to use any stains or that kind of thing, finishing it? I don't use stains though. I don't use stains. What happened mahogany, I, I find that over the years that I get to, at least, I started out using stains, but the mahogany stains itself, that's something that I discover over a period of time. So I use oils. Just set it in motion and as time passes, it just feeds itself and stains itself. Let me say, this is the same medium used by the Almighty when he approached Moses on the mountain. I would be honored to remember that as flames myself, as you know what I mean? I would be honored to, to remember that flame. So I figured the whole public itself, at least this flame, this is flame that, that burned against deep seated racism, 1920s, 30s. This flame that blame, but that blaze for the, the women in this country and the rights of the women in this country, right? These are flames that blaze for um, better education, that's still blazing all now. This is a flame that wouldn't die, and that's how you see the icon himself. agitate but do not violate. For most of his life, Clement Osborne Payne conveyed the powerful message of this slogan as he tirelessly advocated the economic wants and political needs of working people in the West Indies. Born in Trinidad to Barbadian parents, Payne's life in Barbados won him recognition as an apostle of Barbadian trade unionism. He was also under the watchful eye of the authorities at that time and perhaps in an effort to silence him, he was deported to Trinidad on July 26, 1937. This action sparked the historic riots of that night, which in turn prompted the establishment of a region-wide commission of inquiry into the situation in Barbados and other British colonies. This signaled what was arguably Payne's most significant achievement, for the Moyne Commission determined that all of his charges against the island's rulers were accurate and in its report insisted on reforms which he had proposed. In the eyes of artist Don Small, he opened a door for the workers of Barbados, a concept which he explored in the creation of his wood carving to the memory of the right excellent Clement Payne. Well, when the idea came up, I, I actually proposed um, our proposals for two, two um, of the heroes. And I was thinking of Stone and Wood as well. And realizing that, well, Clement Payne and our Barrow basically were still available, a lot of ideas, um, you know, came to me in terms of what to actually sketch and try to propose in terms of a full drawing that can be actually awarded that um, contract basically. Um, with Clement Payne, um, a lot is not written. So my concept basically came from a lot of oral scenes and what took place even from older people, things that were passed down. Um, yes, we know about the riots in 1937, but I choose not to um, portray a bad part of that whole um, situation that happened. Um, the idea was to show him actually trying to empower the people, trying to indicate, um, you know, and guide their path, I would say, because he preached education, I believe more so than any other thing. And I try to use um, certain images as symbols to signify that. For instance, the book that he's actually holding in his hand, basically giving a person a book 
is more so in terms of if you could compare to giving a person a fishing rod more so than giving them a fish. I try to show him actually delivering one of his speeches um, to the people, making him actually larger than life itself, although um, in the structure, normally in terms of a painting or even that particular um, two-dimensional work, normally the top of the painting is perceived to be in the in the background and once he's on that plane he should have been smaller than everything else but I made sure that he's bigger more so than the people um, in front of him or even lower in the foreground actually signifying his power or even the power of his words and it's a setting in the city area where he actually delivered um, the majority of his speeches. I also use um, the bridge and the wharf and the boat in the background to symbolize his deportation to after um, some incident with the authorities and he was deported back to Trinidad. It is um, a relief sculpture. Um, I would say high, high mixed with low relief, where I try to um, get the feel of the figure in terms of how the figures are created. Also, um, the people that are portrayed is is there for everyone to see in terms of the tools that they use um, would would say or say that these are the type of people that he targeted um, during his speeches because they were the ones that were I would say under deprived, underpaid, under everything except what they probably deserved which was the right thing which he most likely advocated. Um, it is set in a uh, a city setting because that's where he actually gave the majority of his speeches and that is um, symbolized by the architecture and the buildings in the background, um, the wharf, um, the, the area where we more so um, export and import our stuff at that point in time and the working class people with their tools in their hands. Can you describe for me the process um, that you went through from the moment that you were asked to make the sculpture? Well, the process, I guess, um, came, I guess, from sketches, conceptualizing it. I knew what I, what I wanted to create it on. Um, I came through the sketches and redrawing and redrawing, redesigning to get everything um, done correctly. Well, that was over, but then the hard work began um, I had to cut two mahogany trees in terms of long ways to get the, um, the wood that I wanted to um, thing. I had to join those pieces together. There were three, three pieces that are joined together and using glues, wood glues, marine glues, that kind of stuff for weather and stuff like that. And when that process was finished, I started by gridding, uh, gridding the wood to the scale of the drawing. And after that process was finished, I draw the, um, the image on and I started to carve using chisels, gouges, and of course my, my mallet. Explain to me a little bit more the symbolism of the open door. I would say that through his speeches, he gave the people encouragement of what is possible. He did not go there and physically break down buildings or whatever the case may be. He did not go to parliament and create things, but he gave the people 
in sight, letting them know that they actually have the power to change things. So through his insights, you know, as we saying, well, he opened the door as, or was up to them to actually look through the door or go through the door. It's not a physical door that he actually placed there, but in terms of mentally, um, a mental self-belief, um, self-confidence, esteem in themselves that they can make a positive change if they choose to. He empowered them. So I would say through that empowerment, um, that was his creation of this space, this mental space that they can actually see what is possible. Like Sarah Ann Gill, Samuel Jackman Prescott's life straddled the pre and post emancipation periods. Prescott's mission was to improve the condition of the free colored people as well as to fight for liberating the slaves. Born out of wedlock in 1806 to Lydia Smith, a free colored woman, and William Prescott, a wealthy landowner, he was named after Samuel Jackman, a rich white planter. In the social environment of the 1800s, men of Prescott's complexion suffered humiliations and were relegated to menial positions in every sphere of life. Fortunately, however, he had no intention of spending his life as a second-class citizen and moved on to become an editor of the liberal newspaper and the first non-white member of the House of Assembly. In both of these endeavors, he fought tirelessly for his beliefs. Juliana Innes, in receiving the commission to portray the right excellent Samuel Jackman Prescott, solicited the help of friend and colleague Wayne Césaire in creating the X. I was quite happy to create a piece that was more conceptual rather than a representative piece um, because I could then draw on elements of history and put them together to, you know, come up with the idea for the sculpture. Um, Samuel Jackman Prescott particularly interests us because he was responsible for the enfranchisement of the free colored people of colored people in Barbados, and um, he also championed the cause throughout the Caribbean. So we drew on elements of Barbadian society, and through reading and, and following up in research, and put all of these bits together to come up with the sculpture. What was most important to you in terms of representing Samuel Jackman Prescott? What were the qualities of the man and what were his achievements that you tried to bring out in the work? He was responsible for bringing the vote to colored people. So that's our first start where we started with an X. Yeah, and Juliana then said, I want to make an X. And then from there, creative juices had to flow. And, you know, it was also the way people who were illiterate signed their name in the old days. It was making your mark. Um, that, that's the most literal thing about the sculpture. Let's call it a sculpture. But um, we've tried to show Barbados through the, the form, starting with the geology, which is at the base of the, of the installation, and then the built environment, and then the social structure as well. Can you describe it a little bit for me, both in terms of the form and in terms of the materials that you chose? Coral stone blocks at the base, on top of which we have the embossed clay, and then the main structure is made of purple hard beams. On top of this we have, and then we have a galvanized up here. You have these two, this window and the wooden panel on the other side. And inside here we have a seascape and a landscape. Now the coral stone, uh, we carved out of regular coral stone blocks. And then this, this clay here was rolled out as a slab and then embossed with leaves, flowers, shells, and coral rock to give a, a, a fossil-like effect to it. And then cut into tiles and then put on, uh, mounted onto, onto the wooden base. Um, a lot of field trips to collect shells, sand, and artifacts that you find on the beach. And then that is all laid out and cast in resin. Same for the landscape where you have bits of cane, pea pods, leaves, rocks, shells, even a centipede. Again, encased in resin, so no fear. Um, galvanized was sourced from an old plantation 
cutting the pieces and then um, the whole thing was lacquered and all these pieces we built ourselves this is a traditional cross shape that you find on the balconies so in terms of representation this represents the physical geolog geological aspect of Barbie it's the coral stone on which the whole island is built and then the clay and on top of which you either have land or, or the seashore and then this is the built environment here you have the wooden structure that really most houses are some, in some way constructed and this ties the whole thing together and the galvanized which is normally on the on the roofs but which are now also used as enclosures you have on this side what the type of color and texture that you would find in the, the villas or see on the west coast or in the, on the heights and terraces of Barbados and on the other side the color and texture of the typical wall of a chattel house. We have um, coral stone, which is, represents the upper classes of Barbados, and then the clay represents the middle class. The galvanized, um, this is the working or lower classes, and the features of this type of window and this color also links back to the West Coast upper class coloring. On the other side with the cream, that is a typical Bajan brown cream chattel house color. And then the green on this side relates to the seascapes, i.e. the Bathsheba areas, that sort of thing, and as well as the fact that we are an island. And the landscape on that side links back to the working class, i.e. the fields, the sugar cane, and that kind of... So that's how the social structure is brought out in the piece. These two also represent different views, literal and figurative, view and viewpoint. You know, if you look out of the typical villa, what you see is the, the shore. This, and if you look out of the typical chattel house, what you see is the land. But, so this is a literal view and a figurative, different views. <laughs> And uh, interestingly enough, the thing that ties the whole thing together is Purple Heart, imported lumber, immigrant lumber. <laughs> We've all come here from somewhere else, so, and this, is, this was the idea. The wood has come from somewhere else, and, but this is what ties the whole physical thing together. But it also represents the Caribbean nature of the, um, the man. Um, and the use of another kind of material from, say, outside of Barbados, which is not typically Barbadian. But the fact that Samuel Jackman Prescott was a Caribbean man, so we wanted to integrate that, and a durable, hard wood, and the best choice was the Purple Heart. When somebody stands in front of your piece and looks at it, what do you think they will read into it? I hope they see Barbados, or see the things in Barbados that they take for granted, um, i.e. the built environment, the channel house, the features of the channel house. Um, pay attention to our environment, our landscape, i.e. the things that live in the ground or are, you can find by the sea. And um, apart from representing Samuel Jackman Prescott, just know that this is Barbados or that X represents Barbados historically, today and in the future. Of all of Barbados' national heroes, the right excellent Garfield Sobers is perhaps the most globally recognized as it was on the world stage that he gained his fame. He has been described glowingly in many ways, but perhaps the most apt is the world's greatest cricketer. Everything he has done in his sporting career has been exceptional, from the day at the age of 16 when he was included in the West Indies team to the records he broke, many of them standing decades later. Ankh Wells, renowned for his wood carvings, received the commission to honor Sir Gary in his conceptual piece, a piece inspired by greatness and grace.
So Garfield is a, is a giant. Um, not through academic learning, but through genius and skill that he has grown over the period of time in his discipline of following cricket. And any individual that can attain to such heights, wow, he just got to give thanks because in lifting himself, he has lifted not only Barbados, but the whole Caribbean. And when Nelson Mandela went to Trinidad, the first person he asked for was Brian Lack. So you could imagine the stature of Garfield Sobers on a global stage. So therefore, I am one of the subjects that was lifted by his greatness. So I try to show for all that power, that strength, that beauty, that majesty, that transcendence in the beauty of Barbadian mahogany. The sculpture, as you see, is someone hitting a very huge blow to the ball. And CLR James says, beyond the boundaries. So I try to show that strength, that beauty, that grace, because not everyone can stroke and see, like some people say, it's sheer poetry, it's sheer magnificence. You know, it's all those things come together in the creative man. And I try to show that strength and that beauty. And again, standing at the bottom, there are two pillars standing on, on the black race, lifting, lifting them up. Well, we nearly end up in the hospital, trying to move this piece of mahogany. Myself and my, my, my workers trying to move this big piece of tree and then trying to slab it down and then trying to get it into because the dimensions was difficult. So we had to get one big tree and cut it in pieces and then join it back together. So that, that was challenging in itself, you know, and then drawing it out and joining it back together, sculpting it and stuff. So, like I said, but not knowing what you're doing and yet coming up with something at the end of the day, wow. difference life becomes boring you know going over the same thing and because we are all different artists not trying to copy each other we all tend to bring a different interpretation a different view a different feeling so that is what we try our strength is in the abstract um, if you ask me to carve something realistic it's like can't make it but I try to feel the vibes and interpret the vibes even when my conscious self and this is very important. Sometimes as an artist, you're not always working from the conscious, but you're working from the unconscious that you don't even know that you know. So sometimes I just sit down with a piece of paper and I just try and divorce and allow the other self to just draw. And then I put it together and then something comes up that I really enjoy. Because I, I like to approach my art not knowing what I'm doing. I find I am better that way instead of remaining within box. We had an original sketch which we submitted, which was accepted, and then I always try to let people know that don't restrict me to the sketch, you know, leave room for the evolution of the sketch. Because sometimes when you start to work, if you are true to the art, then the art becomes your teacher. And you learn in the process of doing what you thought you knew. So I have to leave room for that expression, because I find if I keep to the original, then the learning process, which I would have learned from doing that particular piece, I would not have grown. So I, I just try to, to have my wings available, so just in case we need to fly, we can fly. One time this particular journalist was describing our work and she says, almost like liquid clay, you know, and, and, and it has to have that movement, that form, you know, um, I think that is the the aspiration to which every artist is trying to move towards, you know, because it doesn't make anything stiff. That, that can sometimes defeat the art piece. So we try to create as much movement and form and relationships and even some kind of surprise somewhere along the line. Right? And the, the coloration of the wood is all the beauty of Barbados, mahogany, the beauty of the greens, the movement of the greens. 
fabulous mahogany is, is so excellent to work with. You know, other woods are hard, but it's too brittle. But mahogany is very receptive to the chisels. You know, so once your tools are in working order, just make you feel like sculpting and sculpting and sculpting. In, in all things, I have learned to give thanks, you know, and I hope this sculpture can speak for itself and, and cause people to reflect, you know, that um, art in its true sense does not belong to boundaries and limitations, you know, but it belongs to the message that it sends when you are standing before it. You know? And all the other pieces in here I was saying earlier lends a reverence to this, to this ground, to this holy place, because this is real. This is a real journey that Barbadians has taken for us to arrive at our present junction. You know, and I just truly give thanks for having been privileged to contribute towards the tangible representation of that journey. Educator to politician, leader of organized labor, parliamentarian, member of the government, and finally to the pinnacle of public life as Barbados' third native governor general. Sir Hugh Springer was an outstanding administrator and was the organizer and first general secretary of the Barbados Workers' Union. He excelled in every office he held, both in Barbados and overseas. The task of building a conceptual memorial to the right excellent Sir Hugh Springer fell to Rasa Kim who explains the thought process and symbolism of his piece. So you is a pretty complex character um, in terms of the, the gamut of the experiences that manifest in his resume. Um, he was an educationalist, um, a champion for a trade unionist, but um, he was also the, the bursar, I think, at the University of the West Indies. The, he was the first chancellor or something like that, I think. But the thing about his life for me is the, the contradictions of a life as a, a social champion, and then also one of the, the, the people who, who kind of orchestrated the, the journey towards independence and the reclamation of, of, the, of the self as a people, the black self. And then at the end of his professional tenure, he becomes the Governor General of Barbados. So for me, that was a, a kind of a, a, a paradox of sorts. And it was the, the hub around which I, I, I constructed the, the concept for the work. I, I, I treated the work as a, a Caribbean altarpiece and um, in it I make gestures to the journey of the man from a state of humility, from um, the basic impoverished environment in which most Bajans of that time grew up under the foster culture and his journey through the very the European traditions tours, academic excellence within the context of European institutions again, and then eventually becomes a representative or the chief representative of the state. This was uh, an unusual commission in that you were asked not to create a portrait of the individual but a more conceptual work. So how did you respond to that? What did that allow you to do? Well, for me that was a vehicle of endless possibilities. Um, I didn't necessarily have to be narrative and I didn't have to be historic correct, historically correct either because um, it allowed me a poetic attitude towards the idea of, of, of this monumental piece. And it also allowed me again the, um, a sufficiently wide scope and scale of material and format that I can investigate, I mean, many nuances within the life and within the office itself, you know. Um, I can explore historical, social, um, domestic, 
and personal things, you know, um, because the, the, the life of this Barbadian is, it represents the collective experience. Um, for me, the, the, the idea of the table as a womb, you know, as a sort of gestation object that um, gives birth to, to the imagination and the collective psyche of a people. Um, for example, um, is at the kitchen table in most Barbadian houses that we develop our moral biases, our religious and political biases, you know, our, our ideas and visions of the world and possibilities of yourself, you know, especially from people like your mother and grandmother, you know, so for me the table is a sort of womb that engenders all the elements that you see here that inform the imagination, you know, and guided the vision of this man, you know, and who was representative of most Barbadians, really. You, you would notice in the work I have used a lot of a lot of old material as opposed to material that could be bought from a store, because um, store-bought material doesn't have the kind of characteristics that I required for this work. Right? The work is built from from materials that I garnished from the underbelly of Parliament itself. Then they were restoring the, the flooring and the paneling and stuff. They, they dumped a lot of the material and I sourced this material out and collected it um, because it had a quality that I thought deserved to be preserved. And this was a good way to preserve it, to invest it with a spirit that, that re-energizes it. The, the remainder of the material was garnished also from the relic old houses from around my district, right? And, um, and I, I figured that this wood, because it has a history with all its scars, you know, and its imperfections, it actually has a historical memory inherent within it from being touched, you know, being, being engaged by other, other forms, whether brutal or loving or whatever, touching and, you know. But it, it results in, in, in a particular characteristic that is impossible to create otherwise, you know. It, it is done by time and environment. This would have been the type of materials too that he would have, that would have informed the environment in which he grew up. You know, like his, 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 his domestic space, you know, it was the architecture of his time, you know. And um, so I tried to create a, a literal monument, an altarpiece that gestures to a, 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 a sort of sainthood, not in a biblical sense, of course, you know. Something on a heroic scale also, you know, and something that cross-references the dynamics of his life's experience. You know, because he's the product of two, two, two cultures, you know, and, um, and that in itself throws up a lot of complicated paradoxes. And I, I try to measure some of these in the work. You will notice too that um, he's only represented here in terms of the symbols of his education and his pursuits and the traditions and institutions under which he, he uh, um, ascended to, to fame and also the symbols of humility and ancestral references. Um, they're references to, to bar, the, 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 the Barbadiana of, of the period, you know, like the, the, the oil lamp and the, 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 the metal can cups. And I, I, think, I think the work also talks about, because the work is, is a work that, that talks about the, the Caribbean experience, you know, and the um, Barbadiana in particular, um, that, as an artist, I also decided to use materials that traditionally are not regarded as art materials. And I was amazed to see that many of the artists had similar ideas, you know, in order to transcend the, the whole traditional approach, the very literary approach to the idea of making art, you know. And um, I think this wood has a similar kind of enjoyment characteristic. It represents that metaphorically at least within the word it has that symbolic connection to Sir you 
as I perceive him in terms of his integrity as a human being, you know, and his, his honest character, you know, and, you know, his exemplary life. Because a hero for me is someone who can overcome insurmountable odds, you know, and, um, and make sacrifices, you know, um, in a selfless way. Because somebody had to, to take that office, you know, but he did it with a sense of nobility because I met the man personally, you know, and as a person, he was really a very noble individual, you know, very benevolent in spirit. Building on the foundation laid by such stalwarts as Sir Grantley Adams and Sir Hugh Springer, Sir Frank Leslie Walcott has become a heroic trade union figure, as much in recorded history as in folk memory. Sir Frank distinguished himself locally, regionally and internationally. He had only an elementary education when he entered the BWU as a paid functionary. It is therefore remarkable testimony to his outstanding abilities, energies and character that he rose steadily within the organization and expanded the role which he inherited from Springer. He served as president of the Caribbean Congress of Labour for three terms. In his distinguished career, he also served as a member of parliament, senator, and was Barbados' first ambassador to the United Nations. St. Lucian sculptor Ricky George, who also created the statue of Errol Barrow in Independence Square, was commissioned to produce the conceptual memorial to the right excellent Frank Walcott. The ambiguity of the dove is twofold in that it depicts not only his ambassadorial role but also uh, the United Nations. Uh, the hands are depictive of um, the trade union workers. The flag, being, the flag of Barbados being drawn over the uh, globe of the earth uh, signifies the, uh, the uh, island of Barbados has been a, pre a premier uh, a Caribbean island. I use plaster of Paris uh, because of the constraint in time. I normally use uh, the molding uh, technique where I would work from clay and mold a piece. But uh, this, with such a limited time, I had to go with a direct application. Uh, it was pre pretty difficult with uh, plaster of Paris as plaster of Paris dries very quickly but uh, I was able to obtain my details. And what about the, the cracks in the, in the globe? Well, <laughs> uh, this is also ambiguous uh, in that uh, it, the, the world is, is presently in such turmoil that I decided to fragment, uh, fragment the uh, earth so that I could uh, allow the, the um, dove to get off from the globe. I mean, it is, it is also dwell in, um, in meaning. And what were the qualities in the man himself that, that most attracted you when you were trying to envision what you would do for them? Well, uh, he was quite a worldly man. Uh, he seemed like an individual who uh, helped many people. The, the, the aspect of his life that I, I was impressed with was the um, trade uh, union movement. Uh, I think he is qualified to be a hero. This is um, the second sculpture of a national hero that you've done recently here in Barbados. Um, they're both very different from one another. How do you think the public will respond to something like this which is really much more conceptual in nature? Uh, it is conceptual, but I think I have kept with uh, my, my realism, which is my forte. I, I am a realist by nature and uh, I tend to um, work with the human figure but in this case we use symbols which were you know still realistic so I, th I think that I have kept with my my theme uh, basically. Have you had other projects within the region? Oh certainly. Uh, 
I have done quite a few jobs in uh, St. Lucia. Uh, in 1999, I was one of the first uh, five Caribbean sculptors chosen to do the sculpture park in Jamaica for the University of Technology. Uh, I have just been commissioned by the government of St. Lucia to do the Heroes Monument. It has been a 12-year uh, process, but finally, I think I have gotten the job to erect this um, seven feet monument. And there are lots of other jobs that I have done in St. Lucia, a bit smaller, but you know, they are also prominent. I did the George F.L. Charles bus for the uh, George F.L. Charles airport. I did the landmark piece at the Bank of St. Lucia called the Aftermath. And there are some other uh, jobs around. And the material that you're using here um, is not one that I've seen used often in, in public sculptures. No, it's not. Um, it wouldn't weather very well in the open, I can assure you. But as it is at present, a mold can be made and uh, a material that is more permanent can be used. It, it was meant to be an indoor sculpture. I was wondering if you could give me a little bit of information about your background training as an artist and a sculptor. I started at a very uh, early age. I went to art school at 15 years attended Johnson Atelier uh, five years later. Uh, Johnson Atelier was a bronze casting in institute in New Jersey. I enrolled in an apprenticeship program for four years. I have worked in uh, several foundries in the United States, learning the lost wax process. Uh, sculpture has always been my passion and uh, I somehow gravitated to uh, public art. I felt it was necessary to bring art to the masses and not have uh, a sculpture in some executive office or painting on a wall. I liked the symbolism of public art. The, uh, the interest or sort of specializing in public sculpture is, is kind of a unique uh, and, and new undertaking in the Caribbean. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think the importance of public sculpture is in the region? Yes, I, I, th I think it brings an awareness to, uh, to the people. I, I think uh, uh, art basically is a, is a method of communicating and uh, I am happy that Caribbean governments have embraced uh, the symbolism of public art. I think it goes a long way. Uh, I am happy that um, I have been chosen as a sculptor for um, several of these jobs. As I have stated, it's my passion to bring art to the people. Passageway linking the Heroes Gallery and Parliamentary Museum are two murals on either side of the corridor. One depicts the pre-emancipation history of Barbados. The commission for this went to Omawale Stewart, whose in-depth research into the subject matter tells in both the concept and extensive detail in which he speaks of the painting. The main inspiration which would influence the imagery I use was that um, Slavery to me was the capture and the transportation of over 25 million souls from Africa to the New World. So therefore, um, the emotive aspect of it, not just the statistics of slaves, but the great numbers of souls, people who had connections. I made the attempt to trace the journey from the West Coast primarily West Coast of Africa, to the coast, which was a very um, important phase of the Holocaust. Because on that journey, 
um, one can emphasize that people who are being ripped away from their physical domains, leaving their families and actually trodden and meeting other people enslaved on the way to the coast. So that journey was very important. And then to burst out of the, I don't want to say jungles, but to burst out of the hinterland then to the coast. And for the first time, many of the captured people saw the sea for the first time. So you had this big body of water going to infinity. And that, I can feel, was a great shock and a horror to a lot of the people who were brought to the coast. And of course, the first time many of them seen the forts and the ships. The viewer completes the, the story. Um, whether they empathize, whether they're curious, whether they deny, whatever. Um, basically what I want the viewer to do is to travel visually along the mirror as it reads um, horizontally, undulatingly, vertically, and there are certain points on the mirror, visual points which are symbolic, which would reveal the story. For example, um, the sky above the sea is a troubled sky and it travels right over, you understand? Because you want to capture that whole feeling throughout the centuries. The hold of the ship, there's a particular part of the mural that I hold daily because on reaching the coast, the and captured individuals were placed in the hole, which is really a belly of a ship. And one would know that the middle passage was one of the most dehumanizing experiences in the whole slave trade and in the whole period of slavery, where varied people, ages, languages, families, orientations were just treated as cargo, human cargo, under those cruel circumstances. Then we come to the new world and if you would notice that I have the windmill like a juggernaut and that represents symbolically the economic determinant, the reason, one of the main reasons for new world Caribbean slavery, sugar. And that was physically placed on the landscape, animated with the arms, and it became um, a central part of Caribbean slavery. And I've placed it there to remind us of that, one of the economic determinants of slavery. As we travel down the windmill, and we come to the enforcement, the atrocities, the pain, the flogging, the murder, the chattelization of, of human beings. Um, I have a very strong image of a kneeling slave being whipped. And one of the legacies of slavery is the psychological legacy. And whipping must not only be seen as physical, but it was also done to break the spirit of resistance. The two central images of the enslaved, male and female, why I use a couple is because um, demographically and physically young people were preferred, obviously for obvious reasons. Young, healthy, you have them as beasts of burden for a longer period. And um, the irony is that these young people had to perpetuate slavery in terms of the Creole, those born in the West Indies, really, Codrington Estate, 
and here you had young people, very young people actually. The average age, history shows that the average age of many of the slaves were in the early, late teens, early twenties. And um, a lot of the implements used to control and to subjugate people were indicative and obvious. For example, the chains, the screws, there were a lot of a lot of serious instruments of torture. And one mustn't forget that uh, we're not speaking only about the English slave administration, but one of the most cruel in the world, the French Cold War in the 17th century, where they developed systems of torturing and you understand and, and, and putting down slaves slave reprisals and so forth. Um, also in the faces of the two relatively young slaves you would see the resistance. Then the field slaves. That whole panorama and cascade of field slaves working in the field and What's interesting about it to me is the ratio of male and female workers in the field. Um, female slaves in general and in particular in Barbados did a tremendous amount of physical work supporting and establishing sugar. There's some edifices there, buildings, you know, great house and some royal palms above. Again, um, I believe that the royal palms, the tallest structures in the landscape, like the, um, yeah, they were taller than the windmills, in a line, in order close to the great houses, I believe that they played a part in the flat landscape. To intimidate the slaves. There are a lot of things that were done that were more of a social psychological nature. And um, I use them in that way. Like sentinels looking and watching and so forth. Then I come down into the rhythm of the cane field, which is rhythmic, the crop time, and you will see two figures to make more than two. Um, yeah, you'll see the cane cutter, which I bring more to Barbados. Because remember slaves were also urban. You have slaves working urban. Remember the Caribbean was also um, a maritime maritime country because it was part of the triangle sending sugar and rum and tobacco back to Europe. So obviously a lot of slaves had to be working on the dock sites and in the cities and as artisans and coppers and carpenters and so forth. The female figure there that is protesting represents the house slaves and many of which were female and also had the indignity of the sexual abuse and the use of the slave masters and often ironically had to nurture the children of the oppressors at that time in turn will come around come and oppress their children also the women in slavery were at the bottom like Atlas was at the bottom of the whole structure of slavery Caribbean slavery because um, they also had to maintain the quote unquote slave families at that time and in addition to working and raising other people's children they also had to preserve their fragile family units and also in some research I did had to prevent their mates I can't call them husbands their significant others from 
rebelling spontaneously and obviously having themselves eliminated so basically it is a literal a literal um, piece of art where I tell a story try to explain some things which some which are obvious some which are unknown but at the same time it is a work of visual art and what I attempted to do as a visual artist was to use a medium of color and in this case line because usually when I paint monumental pieces of work like this one is tempted to sacrifice line and get into masks and juxtaposition and stuff like that and mainly the design content but once I had composed it satisfactorily I then started indulging things On the opposite side of the corridor to the pre-emancipation mural is one dedicated to the post-emancipation period, with images heralding people and events up to 2007. The responsibility for the conceptualization of this piece fell to Coral Bernadine, who pulled on two significant words of our national anthem as a theme, upward and onward. It's all about post-emancipation, and when I started, I started right there with the lick and lock up. I put children in the foreground coming, coming forward. And from there, I took it from there. We took in the 1937 riots on the right. We went up to that. And then on the left, we went up to the 40s, the, the unions, those, those, um, those days when people really started protesting for their rights. Behind the, the crowd, the lick and lock up that crowd, I say, you see that they have turned kinda in praise. And the church that dominates the center is the Shere Moravian Church, which was one of the churches that the slaves first worshiped. And from there, of course, it goes right up the the the, the, church, the cross and the flag, and then it it spreads out. So that the center is the is the thing that tells the story from say emancipation until like independence. And then we go off to the left, to the top. We have um, Sir Grantly, who was the Moses and the father of Barbados, and to the extreme left is a freedom fighter herself, Miss Sarah Ann Gill. For the rights of, and you see the, the, the chapel of the, um, the Methodist Church going up in flames, and she fought for the rights of, of the Methodist Church, Bible in hand. And then, to the bottom, a strong woman in the cane fields, and the slave, we have a little, hints of slavery in the slave parts that still exist and, and the slave masters and the lick and lock up down call you see the birth of, of, um, of freedom in the chains. Now this is this is all happening here to the left. To the right <laughs> we have a similar a similar thing where we go into the, the 1937 riots and then we, we keep going the actual work in the fields, the plantations after that was finished, after slavery was finished people continued to work but it was a, it was a difference in that you'll see the women going along the road with their baskets and there's one woman there holding a little boy these women really, uh, to this day, paved the way for their um, descendants, for 
educate them and at the end of the road you see one woman has stopped and um, a boy in Ganga Mortabor going towards the university. So that's, that tells the tale of what those women did, those freed women. At the extreme right is the, just as we have the, the, the woman, we have the man in the field. And then we have, with the plantation, we have a little village. And out of that village, you will see to the extreme right. You see, everything is kind of balanced. It's another national hero, sir. Garfield Sobers, rising from that village, and then you will see the um, the World Cup Kensington, and you will see him like a colossus over there, and then are uh, coming now, as I tell you, that the, the balance, of, the balance now for Sir Grantley is Errol Barra, right honourable Errol Barra. Father of Independence, and I think that's simply it. <laughs> you know, um, so everything kind of ties in from the liquor lockup down days up to independence and forward. It's something it moves upward and onward. I submitted. Um, uh, uh, a small drawing that, that will be scaled, scaled to this. Uh, the scale was an inch to a foot. I scaled my drawing so that whatever area I knew exactly where I would put what. But there were little changes, something that you were inspired to do, a little something else as you went along. And I started actually from the center. I started with the children. It gave me a kind of incentive to keep going. And sometimes we add on other little things, you know. But um, as I went on, I kind of put everything that I had planned. There are people still striving, still going on, and that they're it was a lot to conquer in those days, but as you see, the mural keeps going, it keeps going. From a very little hint, it is just a small hint of slavery there with the rider, but after that, we are emancipated and we keep going, keep going. Independence and the world is ours. memorials to our national heroes based on the artist's interpretation of lives well lived in the service of the nation and its people are pieces which inspire contemplation. Whereas viewing a realistic statue or portrait may cause a viewer to reflect, searching for the deeper meaning behind a conceptual piece can at times bring about a greater understanding and appreciation of the achievements of the people portrayed. The explanations given by the artists in this documentary are but only an insight of their thinking and their concepts. We hope that as a viewer, you've been inspired to look deeper into the lives of our national heroes and develop your own concepts of heroism. Thank you for watching. <laughs>